Uh, welcome to this event of the Institute of Transport Study. I'm Becky Liu, Director of the Institute. Uh, today we shall have Dr. Idalina Matello Babiano sharing with us. So Durley is Senior Lecturer in Urban Planning at the University of Melbourne. So previously she taught at the University of Queensland. Her PhD was from the University of Tokyo and her Master's and Bachelor from the University of the Philippines. I have known Durley since uh, 2017. I don't know whether she remembers. Of course. Uh, when, <laughs> when we were at the International Round Table on Gender, Transport and Land Use at the World Society for Transport and Land Use Research Conference in Brisbane. I have been impressed by Durley's passion for the Women in Transport Leadership Initiative. So through supporting the initiative uh, event over the years, I have the privilege to talk to female PhD students, especially from Southeast Asia, about the problem that they have encountered. Uh, it is indeed a long way before women academics and professionals are respected, not to mention about taking up leadership roles. So we still need to work hard to break the glass ceiling, so to speak. And at the University of Melbourne, Durley has taken up this responsibility of being Assistant Dean, Diversity and Inclusion. An architect, urban planner and transport planner by training, Durley teaches urban design and placemaking for the built environment. So her 126 page book, Placemaking Sandbox, Emergent Approaches, Techniques and Practices to Create More Fiving Places, co-edited with Killam Paliani, has been published by Paygrave Macmillan last year. So here again, I share many visions with Durley to make public places vibrant, people-oriented, and place-based. But how is place-making relevant to transport practitioners? Uh, what can be done? So let us now invite Dr. Mat Matalo Babiano okay. to speak to us. So Durley, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Becky. Um, I was just wondering, could you see now my screen? Have I shared it already? You have not. Oh, I haven't, okay. Mm. So that becomes, huh. so I actually need to turn this off again because I, I couldn't go back to, um, yeah, so I need to share it first, okay. So thank you very much for that very nice introduction. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, indeed, it has been quite a long time already that we've known each other. Yeah. And I'm, yeah, I'm very impressed as well with the, that was the main reason why I've invited you to the round table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, because I think what you're, you, you do model, um, you know, uh, leadership, in, women, le women leadership in transport. Thank you, well, I'm humbled. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now I will try to share my screen. Okay, please. Okay, I need to, I think I need to click something, right? Like um, the, the, the sound. Mm. My apologies if it's taking so long. <laughs> uh, it's fine. Okay, yeah. share screen and then... I'll let you know if we see it. Yeah, okay. So Microsoft Power One, yeah, that's right. Oh, I wasn't Ooh, able to share that. Up. It's coming yeah. up. Yeah, okay. Can you, okay, can you see it now? Yes, please, okay. go ahead. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I would start with um, cities, right? So cities are changing very rapidly. And um, even the vib our vibrant public spaces that make for inclusive, engaging and resilient cities are also becoming problematic because um, you know, of such huge problems that we are encountering beyond climate change, um, you know, urban densification, et cetera. And so our conventional ways of doing thing, things, methods in transportation planning that we traditionally use might not be applicable anymore at this point. So, you know, our transport environments may need alternative ways in order for us to come up with a more inclusive uh, public spaces. So in this session, I will introduce a new space making as a potential thinking tool to think about transport as a place. So this is something that's quite different, I think, as, um, as how we have been, I guess, formally taught. And use placemaking as a lens to reimagine transport environments. So that's what I would like to introduce. Um, and this came about 
through the work that I have been doing as part of the place agency um, consortium. And so we, uh, seven universities and 14 industry partners, I'll show you who our partners are um, in the next slide. Um, we have co-created research and education program, which we call Placemaking Sandbox Program. And so the intent for this is to create greater agency, to build capacity of people. And in our case, these are students and some sometimes practitioners as well, for them to invest places, spaces with meaning, as well as to increase active citizenship and responsibility. And of course, to link social and economic and ecological systems of place. So as I mentioned earlier, we this is seven universities led by the U University of Melbourne and 14 industry partners. And if you would like to know more about the project that we have uh, co-created in the past four years, since 2017, um, this is the web our website, so www.placeagency.org.au. And all our materials here are free to download, so they're open access. And what you will see now in my presentation, some of these slides are actually have actually been drawn from all these presentations. And we have also um, documented all the studios that we have so far um, implemented across these seven universities. So we have had, I think, about 32 now since 2017 um, as part of our different faculties. So um, yeah, Becky introduced me earlier. I'm Dori, I'm an academic from the University of Melbourne. And um, I would like to acknowledge that some of the materials that I will use today, as I've mentioned earlier, have been materials prepared by my colleagues in place agency, particularly Dr. Elisa Palacio of the University of New South Wales, as well as Dr. Ginny uh, Lee. And of course, most importantly, I would like to thank uh, Professor Becky Liu for this invitation, for this opportunity to be with you um, this afternoon. In Australia, we start usually our presentations with an acknowledgement of country. So I would like to uh, acknowledge that I am presenting from the lands of the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of this land, Kulin Nation, here in Melbourne, where I'm zooming in and presenting today. And I would also like to pay respects to their elders past, present, and emerging, and extend that respect to all other First Nations people who are attending this session today. As I have introduced earlier, our hyper-dependence um, on the private car did not only reinforce a car-centric way of life or lifestyle, but this also brought a very unsustainable world. This has resulted in negative externalities, um, including congestion, environmental pollution, increasing rates of vehicular accident. And of course, our public spaces have been invaded by concrete. Our cities have become concrete jungles wherein um, on average, about 30% of our public spaces are actually being allocated for the purposes of accommodating movement for the private car, for parking, and for road space. But cities are not just for movement. Our transport system is also places in their own right. Um, the, this negatively affects our public realm and our public life because of that focus on movement. Yet, transport spaces, as I mentioned earlier, can be used informally or formally as places. So places to shop, to meet, to play music, listen to music, to have coffee, uh, to chill, eat ice cream, as you can see from the photos. So one example, so this is the Tokyo Station in, in Japan. A transit precinct is actually an example of a public space, right? So transport environments, such as what you see here, both accommodate both movement and non-movement functions. So what is the concept of movement and place? So this is a, co a concept that has been introduced uh, by Jones in the early, I think, 2000, in 2009. And this has been adopted already by the Department of Transport here in Victoria, as well as um, New South Wales government in terms of how they manage uh, transportation. So they use movement and place thinking in the planning for transportation. And they have three guiding principles. Number one, it's people first meaning putting the users at the center of everything. But I would also argue that it's not just the people or it's not just this, um, the, what's this, the, the users, but it's also the workers, right? The, the, the drivers, our operators, as well as the more than human users of transport, right? So, you know, our dogs, our, um, uh, our animals, our, um, you know, um, so our animals are also considered to be users of transport for some in, in some occasions. 
And second one is outcomes focus. So we fo focus on the deliver deliverable, more about connection, more about um, interactions, more about confidence in our travel. And of course, we need to consider this as one system. So it's not just about, you know, the, the interaction between one mode to another, but the interaction of mode with the land use that surrounds it, right? So we have three aim, uh, aims in this presentation. So first, to increase our knowledge and, and understanding about how transport can become place and what's the role of place making. Then secondly, basically that's the same uh, aim, is to comprehend how place making can be used as a tool in the planning for our transport. And then third, to learn about adaptability in transport design and planning processes and develop operational skills in how we can adopt adaptive design within the context of transportation. So before we go into the nitty gritty details, I would like to introduce the concept of place. So what is place, right? So um, when we talk about place making, place is central to that conversation. So when we think about place, the best metaphor to describe it is actually through the difference between house and home. So when we build house, um, because obviously I'm an architect, as to, um, my background is architecture. So we build a house with columns, with walls, uh, rooms um, for different uses, right? And then when people live in that house and make memories and find meaning and um, build relationship in, the, in that house, it now becomes a home where you want to stay, rest, have people over, um, you know, make memories together. So it's the same as a placemaker. So our role in space, in, in, in looking at space, is to transform it into a place. So what you can see from this figure, space and place, that overlapping yellow center is what is place. Because when people uh, collide with um, uh, in space or, you know, occupy space and make memories, and then it becomes place. But another argument that we would like to make in place agency is that it's not just about the space and people, but it's also about ecology. Because space and people are but a, you know, a component of a larger socio-ecological system. And in placemaking, what we're really interested in is developing those positive relationships between people, space, and nature. So what, this is what we call a relationship-based model. Yeah. So this is the place matrix diagram that place agency has created. So as I've mentioned, it's a relationship-based model. Right, so the purpose of placemaking is really to connect people to place through share, shared meaning and a sense of purpose. Usually when we talk about placemaking, the discourse, the discussion is really about the communities and self and the public space. It's usually the conventional, the usual way of the discussion around placemaking. As I have earlier suggested, Really, in that conversation, we need to include the natural environment. Think, for example, of the cultural and environmental ecosystem services it provides, right? So when you feel better, your uh, mental and health well-being is improved just by being in a green space, right? So that's why it's really important that we include um, natural environment in that discussion of place. So. Again, place is that center, right, between space, people, and ecology. But more importantly, placemaking, our ambition in placemaking is to strengthen those relationships. Is that, is that, and that's the red arrows that you see in that diagram. So the relationship between community and space, self and community, and we will, and the outcome of that would be sense of belonging or place belonging, right? If we are, uh, sorry, sense of belonging. If we are talking about communities and space, we are looking at enhancing a sense of place or empowerment or care for place. When we are, we are trying to strengthen the relationship between the self and the natural environment, we are looking at enhancing biophilia or our personal connection to nature, right? How we commune with nature. And when we are looking at um, the environment and the public space, what we're really intending to do, our aspiration in this space, is to increase the ecosystem services. So those are the relationships that we are trying to build through placemaking. So the positive relationships. So the idea of a transit precinct as place is that transit hubs or stations 
are not only spaces for mobility, but they are also places that cater for non-movement activities, social activities, um, some activities that would allow you to interact with others. So we can explore the relationship between transit precinct and the social dimension of the place through, for example, undertaking spatial analysis, right? So that's for them. So what's placemaking? So this is the tool that we will use to try to build those relationships, right? So placemaking is a way of shaping the places that we love to ensure that we give them meaning. So it's connecting people to place through shared meaning and a sense of purpose. So it's space plus meaning is equal, equal to place. So basically placemaking is one strategy to support thriving places. So it's fostering agency within ourselves, within our community to shape public space into place, right? It's that, um, it's that process that allows us to um, create a constellation of meanings and um, encourage appropriate behaviors in space to create a positive li lived experience in this social setting. So it's basically, um, you know, shaping places that we then love and we then, um, take stewardship and custodian, custod, um, be custodians to ensure that it doesn't deteriorate, deteriorate but actually uh, provide um, more positive experiences to others. So placemaking can be a product, but it also could be a process. So as a product, it could be that tangible outcomes like, you know, um, benches, chairs, ways to engage with people, but it could also be narrative of place. So for example, um, you don't need to modify anything, but it's allowing a program of activities that would allow people to understand the story of that place. So that's, you know, it's the intangible outcome of, um, of public space through placemaking. And there's also the uh, idea of placemaking as a process. So when I teach my students about placemaking, I us usually pitch it as a potential thinking tool as what I am now doing with all of you is to look at placemaking or to use placemaking as a potential thinking, uh, thinking um, tool for people to um, look at the, the potential of space. So it's finding ways of incorporating the voice of community, for instance. Um, so we undertake participatory and um, different forms of engagement with community. And that's the way we use placemaking. So why an adaptive approach to placemaking, right? So what is adaptive approach? So as I have earlier pitched in my presentation, conventional approaches to the planning, design, and management of transit precincts may no longer be appropriate due to the rapid transformations of um, you know, challenges in urban spaces, in our cities and our communities. So we need to rethink of the, the usual, the ways that we usually do things and see what are the alternatives, right? And so that's why adaptability as a concept has four dimensions. And this concept that Elisa, uh, Dr. Elisa Palacio uh, from the U University of New South Wales introduced. So she argues that there are four dimensions of adaptability, that's transdisciplinarity, multifunctionality, incremental change, and resilience. And this is what she suggests are approaches to support transfer transformation in urban places. So when we talk about transdisciplinarity, it's that social perspective um, of place, wherein our focus is on the governance of place, where adaptive co-management approaches are um, encouraged and highlighted in, in community, in ways when we, we um, organize or when we collaborate with communities. So it's usually action-oriented approaches, right? On the other hand, multifunctionality is where is the functional aspect of it. So the um, technical perspective. So it's done through programs where we draw from strategy of um, multifunctionality of programs, how you know, how we can redesign a space through different uses temporally or spatially. And incremental change is focusing on the economic or temporal perspective, where the focus is on incremental change or transformations or incremental knowledge building. So it's looking at, um, you know, urban acupuncture, wherein you try to find the acupuncture points to, to start that transformative process. And the fourth one is resilience. 
And this is about the environmental perspective, where in our con corresponding um, strategies would be nature-based biodiversity, increasing or enhancing biophilic or biophilia and regenerative approaches, right? So those are the four things. And I will be providing some examples after I've defined each of those terms. Okay, so when we talk about transdisciplinarity, so these are um, cities, we know that cities and communities usually are evolving their dynamic and the, and they become they change because of the different decision makings we decision making we make in our own role if we are with the government or we we are with acad, uh, the academe or part of civil society we make decisions every day as human beings and those decisions have impact on the built environment so i would like to highlight that in transdisciplinarity there is a crucial and vital role that the community plays because they are the ones who are collectively constructing our urban environment so it is important that we look through we look to them as um not just operate the way the the individuals or groups who operationalize ideas but they are the ones who have the local knowledge of place right so so basically they are they have they they have the knowledge the they are the owner of space and that knowledge actually has to supersede our own knowledge as expert in, for example, if we look at transportation, right? So we need to understand what are the different ways of traveling from A to B, but at the same time, what else do they use um, transportation for? And these perspectives are really critical if we want to design a more responsive transport system. So it's about co-management of space involving local communities as to, when we say local communities these are people who are residing in the place or living in the place it they could also be people working in the place who, or visitors of the place right so these these are the individuals who have ideas on what works well within the um, place and that knowledge is really core when we are planning and designing and managing our public spaces and of course this requires um strengthening partnerships with um these groups right and as a transport planner sometimes we think that we are expert we know what solution we can provide to them however we also need to acknowledge that they have this local knowledge and that local knowledge must guide the way that we plan our transport environments because in the end they will be the users of those um, facilities and if we are encouraging you know more public transport uptake it is really important to what ex uh, to understand what are the um i guess aspirations and needs and wants of those people who would be using public transport and ensuring that when we design we take on a user-centered approach that would then drive and it's not just about the users that we know of as you know usual users of public transport but we also need to consider other local stakeholders those particularly who are um disadvantaged who are usually marginalized by transportation right and um yeah we can talk about it in in a while and yeah so this is again the movement and place um engagement framework so it's about co-management co um uh co-production with community right and so this concept that the new south wales government implemented is to engage with aboriginal so indigenous communities as um knowledge um knowledge owners knowledge uh shareholders and gather their um their knowledge to then develop an engagement framework like how do you um strategically align um, inclusive practices mitigate challenges and reduce cost over the li life cycle of a pro uh, of a project but ensuring that you have been engaging even before the you know even before the project com um, started so with this actually they have um partnered with um two point company so it's an aboriginal and Torres Strait islander um consultation business and so um sometimes in Australia, when you when um, you are developing a plan or you are um, developing an uh, what is a development, there is that fundamental understanding 
um, fundamental acknowledgement that everything is on is happening on Aboriginal land. So because of that understanding, when we are planning for a particular development or a particular um, building structure, etc., there is that intent to engage with um, you know, indigenous groups, indigenous communities, and it's not just engaging as consultation, but really partnering with them. And so this engagement framework was um, developed precisely for that. How do you engage in an authentic manner um, with, you know, with um, indigenous communities in the place that they will be um, developing? And so the framework was based on desktop research, but also in consultation with um, Aboriginal and uh, staff and elders. So it is based on the six guiding principles um, um, around knowledge and awareness, partnerships and collaboration, uh, communication, meaningful engagement, sustaining con uh, evaluation, and sustaining connection. So there is that framework that could then be utilized by different um, transport um, groups or trans, um, uh, what's this, subdivisions within New South Wales government to then use this to, I guess, guide them in engaging with uh, the cultural protocols of place. So some other collaborative tools that have been used in my, in my classroom and classrooms of uh, my colleagues is the um, Imaginarium. So this is not necessarily a transport project, but I thought the idea was really great. So the students came up with the concept of Imaginarium. So um, Port Phillip, uh, the council, um, ran a studio, so co-design and co-implement um, a studio with University of Melbourne. And so the students um, had to reimagine or come up with some engagement strategies to engage people in Port Phillips and to reimagine this park, right? So the, the idea is to, uh, they, they brought in, in a one day exercise, uh, brought in this Imaginarium. So it's just a, a clear um, plastic that's mounted on wood. And then each individual who would be coming, like passing through the area, would then be invited to draw and basically reimagine the background, right? So the background is what, what they were intending to change, right? So they would then draw on it, and then um, the student or this one of the students in the team would take a photo and hang it um, as some of, you know, some potential ideas of um, changing or improving the place. So that's the concept of imaginary. And of course, modeling is one way that we, we usually employ. So scale models wherein um, students would come up with per se, and then they would reimagine, so come up with a scale model for the place and then um, try out some ideas um, in that scale down model. So that's some of the uh, tools that we can use when we are talking about, uh, when we are using the concept of transdisciplinarity. So now we talk about multifunctionality, right? So as I've mentioned earlier, um, we need to really consider um, diversity. So when we are planning for spaces, um, our cities and communities are definitely composed of individuals who possess multiple and diverse um, identities and abilities within the context of public spaces, right? So as you can see on the videos on the right, it stopped already. Um, I can do it again um, in these two videos. Um, so the one on the upper one is an able individual um, who probably earns less, for instance, but is able body. So there's no physical disability and no caring responsibilities. And also he lives in an accessible community. So probably that's why he can ride the bicycle around. Um, while relative to the person on the lower photo diagram uh, who, who has, um, let's say, who has a disability, so he, she is a person with disability, but also must care for her young child and lives in a place that might lack public transport. And so judging from these two individuals, they have this um, multiple, uh, he, she has multiple disadvantages that needs to be considered when um, we are planning for transport, right? So really important that we need to think of space as a, um, you know, as a, I guess a competing space with competing different needs. And we need to factor those in when we are planning. So, you know, we need to think about how do we 
create multiple um, multifunctional land uses or in landscape planning, how can we cluster, you know, natural, social and economic processes, right? Being smarter and clever when we are designing and planning for transportation. So for instance, how do you create a microclimate, a more comfort, particularly in Hong Kong, and I'm originally from the Philippines, so the tropical climate sometimes is too harsh in, a, you know, in the summer. So how do you then create, you know, a microclimate that's comfortable for walking or for, um, you know, staying outdoors? So maybe we can use a bit of, you know, trees in, in, in the area, but at the same time, it also addresses the problem of pollution, for example. Um, yeah, so thinking of the key themes there would be design for all ages, um, user-friendly design, responsive design, ergonomics. I think what's missing here is universal, universal design principles. It's also one that takes into consideration. And multifunctionality is also recognizing the diversity of the whole transport journey experience, right? So when we are talking of public transport, sometimes we think of it in, as a homogenous public space, right? But actually, we have very different experience when we are going through the walking environment, you know, accessing public transport. And it's a very different experience when we are waiting in that environment, when, you know, before the bus comes or before the train uh, arrives. And a very different experience, again, when we are riding on the bus or riding in the train, right? So understanding this difference in um, transport journey experience across these spaces is really critical. So the difference is not just spatial, but also temporal, like, for example, in the day versus in the night. So we, we tend to like, and also like um, the previous slide showed um, you the diversity of individuals because of their identities, right? So overlapping it with um, the spatial and as uh, the spatial environment, then you could then see that even with experience would be different across gender. So for example, a female would feel differently in a walking environment during the day and at night as compared to their male counterpart. So understanding those differences. Okay, so of course, rec recognizing that public transport also has, um, has multiple functions, right? So as you can see here, this is a photo that I have, um, cap um, I think I've taken this from Pub Project for Public Spaces. Um, with the concept that they have introduced power of 10 plus, right? So they argue that for a space to, to activate a public space, it is important that it has to have at least 10 uses. So for example, within transit precinct to thrive, for it to thrive, we need to consider at least 10 uses for that space. So for example, here you can see read the paper, window shop, learn about upcoming events, go inside, walk by, et cetera. So if you are able to identify 10 spaces, sorry, 10 uses within that public um, like transit precinct, then there is that possibility that that place would thrive. And this is, of course, um, one example of multifunctionality is the Kyoto Station in Japan, wherein there is that vertical mix of uses and when this is one of the country's largest um, buildings, it has a 15-story structure how, uh, providing house um, shopping malls, hotels, movie theaters, department store, and even government facilities, right? So another way that we can, uh, I guess, operationalize the concept of multifunctionality is through digital placemaking, wherein we try to deepen our experience of place through placemaking and activation. And this is an example of dig a digital crossing and marking that appears according to real-time need, right? So apart from the crossing points, if someone is distracted and get, gets too close to vehicles nearby, nearby cars and cyclists, we'll see a warning pattern and then it would, you know, it would it immediately light up. And, um, you know, digital technology can, use, um, can be used to transform BC urban environments to a more welcoming, safer space for everyone. And of course, not necessarily transport again, um, this is the Super Kilen. Oh, I'm not sure if I can do that. Oh, yeah, I can do that. So this is Super Kilen public space in uh, Copenhagen. So it's a project representing multifunctional use of space. So it's a linear park. You can see on the figure on the right. So there is that um, red square 
there's the black market in the center, and then there's a green park. So the red square is designated for modern urban life with cafe, music, and sports. The middle one is the black market, wherein there's a classic classic square with fountain and benches. And then the right side is more of the for the um, um, attracting the sporty people, like you know um, those who wanted to go for picnics, sports, and walking their dog. Right. So this is just one example of how public space promotes. And this is also a public space that promotes integration across um, culture, because apparently there are, I'm not sure how many representations of um, different cultural groups in, in, in this space. Right. Okay. I'm not sure how much time we have. Okay. So we still have probably like 10 minutes, I guess. Um, okay. Um, I'm not sure if we have time. I'll just, I'll probably turn this on so that you can hear it. Hopefully you can hear the, the sound. This area is one of the areas in Copenhagen with the highest crime rate, or maybe even in the entire Denmark, it felt very unsecure. To make the Nerebro neighborhood safer, the City Hall of Copenhagen decided to create a big public park. Architect Nana Gilto Muller and artist Rasmus Nielsen were in charge of the project. In our very first walk through the area, we could see that there was a big diversity in the people living in the neighborhood. We, we found that it was around 60 different nations living in the area. Rather than seeing the diversity as a problem, we wanted to see it as a resource. So basically that in the park there would be elements from as many countries of the people living here uh, through objects and stories. The golden one is a playground from India and the, the elephant slide is from Chernobyl and um, the red benches over there are kind of a double bench from Switzerland and also one of our favorites is the the Moroccan fountain, where parents often sit and meet and talk while the kids are playing. The ideas of the park was to make use of dreams that could kind of materialize into things. We divided the area in like three parts. The all three areas, they are very different. The red square is uh, mainly for skaters. The black square is more classical square where the locals are hanging out and kids are playing. And then the green park is more uh, for exercise and uh, more bigger sports activities. I'll stop it now. Okay, yeah. So the third approach I was talking about uh, is incremental transformation. So this is about um, slowing down and um, looking at composite and um, processes that generate cities in the past could be considered in contemporary uh, contemporary planning discussion discussion so it's looking at um you know where are the uh, catalysts or so where are the puncture points in a city that you start um improving and enhancing and would lead to improvement or start that transformation process right so it's you know, it's looking at probably incremental improvements of space and how can you identify, for example, slow and small transformation that you can then lead to um, bigger and lo longer improvement, right? So I also synergies between old and new. And some examples of, of this um, is what you've seen earlier about how they've brought in some old materials or from different places around the world, right? But at the same time, we, there's also, as um, you can see from the screen, urban acupuncture, the concept of, um, I think it's an older concept, but the book was written by Jamie Lerner, who's also um, a famous transport uh, planner and, of course, mayor of um, Curitiba and governor of Curitiba as well. Um, and so, uh, he suggested the concept of urban acupuncture, which is very similar to guerrilla urbanism and um, tactical urbanism. And so one example, I guess, of tactical placemaking um, would be the um, 
pop-up bike lanes here in Heidelberg. For, so throughout the pandemic, there was an increase in the number. So we were only able to travel within a five kilometer radius from our home. And so the only things that we could do is actually walk and ride the bicycle, right? So as part of that process, the Department of Transport then implemented some pop-up bike lanes around the city to um, accommodate that increasing um, numbers of bi people riding the, their bicycles. And so after 18 months, um, I think some of these parts or the whole part is actually now being converted, transformed into um, bike lanes. And so that's the idea of tactical place, place making, trying out certain ideas and see how people feel about it. And then if it really works well, then implement it um, in, you know, scale it up or implement it. And of course, creative placemaking is one example. So this is, um, not sure if it's too loud. Sorry. Yeah, so these are Australian birds that were, um, that, so these are installations across Melbourne just a few months, I think in December 2020, they've implemented it. And so this is um, Australian birds in um, by the British artist Julian o Opie. And it was a public art installation um, commissioned by the NGV um, and in partnership with the city of Melbourne. You can see there that's a tram address. So this, it's, it's on an island. It's really interesting if you look at it in the evenings because they are actually, um, you know, they're lighted, lightened up and then you can see it's pitch dark in the background and you can see, you know, seemingly birds walking um, across those, you know, a, a, black, a pitch black background. And, um, sorry. Yeah, another one is the uh, pedestrian bus and how in Italy, they have identified that, you know, uh, there were three schools that were very near each other. And so the community decided that, um, and usually there were competing traffic, you know, cars, as you can see from, I'm not sure if you can see it, the, the cars parked um, in the same public space. And then during, um, during uh, in, the, in the afternoon when they are picking up their kids, you see that competing, you know, people waiting for their kids to come out, but at the same time, there are also uh, cars passing by. So what they did is to, they created a pedestrian network, so what they call pedestrian bus. And I think the concept has been actually introduced by, um, who's this, um, uh, 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 the name escapes me, David Eng Engrich is, is actually a pacemaker who's based in Brisbane. And so he conceptualized pedestrian buses and the idea or walking buses. And the idea is that, you know, kids would um, come together and then collectively go from their home to their, um, and by walking, go to their um, schools, right? So that's the idea. And what they did is then they incrementally improved those spaces that connected these three schools. And eventually it became a network of um, walkable areas. And so it's that idea of incremental transformation. And the fourth one is resilience, right? So there is the concept of re uh, resilience is uh, drawn from environmental perspective. So we know that there is an under understanding of cities as an independent, interdependent, not independent, interdependent of um, system of people and nature, right? So we need to consider them as, so when we are place making, we need to consider um, urban ecology as an important aspect of that place making um, process. So when we talk about the resilience theory, it's that capacity of system to absorb disturbance and reorganize while undergoing change. And it doesn't need to be, um, and it doesn't need to be, go. it can be going back to the same form it had when before the disturbance, but it could also be transforming into another, a different entity, but still, maintaining or retaining the same functions and structures and feedback, right? So that's the concept of resilience. And we can uh, do this through nature-based solutions, ecological infrastructures, designed ecology. So that's, these are some of the uh, key themes as well as biophilic cities. So one example is regenerative placemaking, and this is in, uh, in Sydney. After 10 years of campaigning, Sydney is going to have a world-class greenway right here in the inner west for the first time you'll be able to walk or ride right across the inner west from the cooks river to iron cove 
The draft plan was created with community input and includes a new bridge over the Cooks River, improved public areas and open spaces near Hercules Street in Dulwich Hill, a new accessible shared path along the length of the corridor, the creation of new public open spaces and natural areas near Lewisham West, safer crossings under major roads, and upgraded parklands and new natural areas along the Hawthorne Canal. This is just a small part of what's in store. To see the draft master plan and have your say, jump online at yoursayinawest.com.au. And I just wanted to say as well that this was conceptualized, you know, 15 years ago, and this has gone through um, very comprehensive engagement, not just with local communities, but also with indigenous communities of place. Um, yeah. Okay, so there's another example of resilience, I guess. Not necessarily transport, but the concept of how you integrate nature in cities. So the idea of, you know, um, there was the intent of, it was more of a reporting purposes for people and community to report if there are issues because it's too windy here in, in Melbourne. So um, we usually have to report if there are branches or trees falling down because of the very strong winds. But what happened was that it became um, people writing love letters to all these trees, which was pretty exciting, I think. Um, yeah, so in summary of my presentation, so I've um, covered the four aspects of transdisciplinarity, multifunctionality, incremental change, and resilience as potential approaches that we can adopt when we are planning for transit precincts and, um, and the larger pub urban public space that we, we live in, right? So we are looking at these opportunities on how we can go back into you know, what we have in our urban spaces. So for instance, you know, our, the, the ecological, op the opportunity of um, ecosystem services, the special transformations that, we, that can happen on space and how we can use placemaking as a potential lens or thinking tool to achieve better, uh, better cities and communities. So I guess I would end my presentation. Um, yeah, with these questions, and we can probably have discussions around, you know, what is one concept that you think was interesting, and what would be one concept that you think can be useful in your own studies or in your own transport practice. Thank you. I, um, Thank you I, so much, Dali. Stop yeah. sharing now. Yeah. So that I can see you. Yeah. So, um, uh, I don't have any question in the chat box. I wonder, you know, whether there's anyone in the audience who would like to ask a question. I think there's someone raising a hand. Oh, yes. Zhuang uh, Yunfan, maybe, yeah. Please go ahead. Oh, hi. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your uh, presentation. It's really nice. And, and all those, like, um, case studies, they're very good. I have one question related to the negotiation negotiation process. I will say that a lot of this project involve many many stakeholders. Um, they probably different backgrounds and they also have different interests in the project. Um, can you through your study have you found like um, is there like any common knowledge that they can share like what how they actually implement this kind of projects to have it actually realized to, uh, from the pr uh, perspective of you talking with different groups negotiation with different stakeholders 
Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Very important question because I think placemaking is really about um, engaging and ensuring buy-in of projects. And in the end, the outcome that we really want is to increase stewardship of places that we love, that we feel, um, you know, we, we feel that, you know, when you love a place, you really, you don't want anything bad to happen to it, right? So I guess in terms of engagement, we have created a placemaking reflection tool. Mm -hmm. And in that tool, we have five domains. So depending on who your stakeholders would be, um, and there's also a process of identifying the stakeholders right at the very start and understanding what kind of stake they have and what kind of resources can they bring into the project. And when I'm, uh, when I'm thinking about stake, who has the, um, you know, who, who would be the most affected in the project, but has um, very limited resources. So it means as a, as a placemaker, my role is to amplify their voice, right? To, to ensure that whatever their needs are, and of course, engaging with them at the very start is really important. Um, and these you know, needs have to be at the table when we are discussing with those who have large stake, but also have large power to change things. And we are talking about owners, developers, um, local go government, local councils, right? Because they do have huge stake in their own property, uh, but at the same time, they also have, um, you know, the resources to do things. So making sure that, you know, as a placemaker, my role is to ensure that they are both engaged in the process and there would be different ways of engaging with each other. And that's where the play, so we do have a book, Placemaking for the Built mm -hmm. Environment, edited by um, Christi Christina uh, Santin and Dominique Hess. And chapter 10 of that is actually about how you engage with these different stakeholders. So we call it place leadership. But at the same time, there's also chapter six that would um, teach you how to or give ideas on how you engage with government and um, private industry. So there are definitely different, way, dif different ways of engaging with them, depending on um, their level of resources and um, level of stake. But I think fundamentally, uh, before you even think of doing anything, you really make sure that you engage with community. Um, and I, I would like to leave one thing that, that, that was really very powerful, I think, from one of my students in July. So he is a landscape architecture student. And so as an, a built environment expert or, you know, someone who's being, um, being building, building their capacity as a, a built environment expert, right? So we had this project in um, one of the streets in Richmond here, and we went to the uh, Richmond street and we engaged with uh, a lot of, uh, so we invited about 10 um, community representatives who have been living there for 15 years or, you know, selling things there. Um, the, the, what's this principal of the school, etc. So they gave their, um, I guess, stories, their stories and histories of place. And so, a few days after, they need to do a co-designing, co-engagement, and then co-design. And the, what, what the student was um, said to me as, um, one time when we were just, you know, walking um, on site, she, he said that, you know, one thing that really struck me was that when I started this subject, you know, on day one, day two, I knew already what would happen on that space. I had a clear um, idea in mind what, you know, what transformation would look like, well, uh, the transformation that it would look like. But after, you know, engaging with the students, uh, with the stakeholders, I now realize that, you know, my idea wouldn't work, you know, right? because it was so different from what community wanted and needed. So I was really struck by <laughs> what the <laughs> students said, which right. is, you know, what placemaker, what placemaking is all about. Okay, thanks a lot. You know, I think... Uh... Indeed, this is an art and require a lot of experience. So we have another question, Ming Sun Chen. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, please okay. go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Matteo Fabiano. Uh, I'm a research student from the University of Hong Kong. And uh, I think I've said and thought of the relationship and difference between place and space. So thank you very much for introducing this. Uh, <clears throat> this idea with us. Uh, I would like to know, is there any um, quantitative method for evaluating whether the placemaking objective is well achieved? 
Yeah, that's a good um, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, we do have a rating place. Um, so what we we have the conceptual framework, right? Um, at least from our perspective, we have the place matrix diagram that I have shown earlier, and this is how we should evaluate place. It's about the extent to which specific relationships were built, um, and I guess that's one dimension of it. And how do you then translate that relationship to quant you know, quantify it might be very interesting research. So to sh a short answer, no, we haven't had that uh, opportunity to do, to do it, but that's a way that we can obviously um, you know, advance. Yeah, so yeah, I think this is a good question in a sense, you know, a lot of people say, you know, what got measured, you know, got done, right? Yeah. So with, that's a lot of good story to tell, but essentially how do we say, you know, this place making exercise has been mm. successful or not? It really, you know, maybe need to rely on some quantitative measures. So if there's no additional question from the floor, maybe I ask the final question. <laughs> Yeah, Danny, I just wonder, you know, for any place making exercise, uh, this is going to take time and engaging with a lot of stakeholders, you know, kind of a, of a process and involving a lot of changes. But uh, as a place, continue to evolve with new people coming in, etc. So my question is really, how often do you think a place should undergo a place making exercise? Or what are the signs that probably like uh, near Park Fulham, we probably would need a place making exercise soon. Is there any clue or any experience that you can share with us? Um, so that's really an interesting question because I think uh, depend, there are so many factors that you might want to consider, right? So mm -hmm. for example, the imaginary support, uh, print, uh, sorry, uh, the Port Philip Council, uh, reached out to University of Melbourne because they wanted to do something about the park. They wanted to improve it and enhance it and make it, you know, um, flashy and nice. And uh, yeah, so we, so our students, I wasn't part of that uh, studio, um, but Dr. Dominique Hess was, so who led this uh, project. And so she went through that process and asked students to engage with community. And in the end, the community actually said that they that you know the coffee shop there in fronting you know front the of the plaza of the park and you know the stones there actually had memories and meanings to a lot of people in the community and in the end it was just a matter of enhancing some parts but not necessarily you know changing the whole place and i guess the question that the answer is you really need to consult the community if and when change is necessary Mm. <laughs> I guess, yeah, so maybe that's my answer. Yeah, that's really great. 